Chairman Duffy, Vice Chairman Russell, Vice Chairman Maxwell, unit leaders, members, board members, trustees, and friends. It is good to be back in my home state of California. And with the great California State Conference, home to great warriors like Alice Huffman, the incomparable Willis Edwards, the Reverend Dr. Amos Brown, one of only six students Dr. King ever had, a second being Julian Bond, and young leaders like Zephanie Smith. Before I get started, please allow me the indulgence of recognizing my family. I'm joined today by three of the most important women in my life. My mom, Ann, trained by Juanita Jackson Mitchell, desegregated her high school in 1964. Well, 54, 258, mom, yes, thank you. Um, and who never shies away from correcting her son on stage. <laughs> My wife, Leah, who is a fierce advocate for civil and human rights in her own right, as you saw yesterday. And my daughter, Morgan, who is a budding champion for all people under four feet tall, a talented debater. She bested me when she wasn't quite two years old and a sixth-generation member of the NAACP. Thank you for giving them and for giving all of the families that support all of us in our shared work a hand. I am proud to serve as your 17th president, proud to serve alongside Chairman Brock, and proud to stand before you today and say that the state of the NAACP is strong. Since the start of 2008, the ranks of our online activists, disproportionately young people, but increasingly people of all generations, have swollen from 170,000 then to more than 510,000 today. At the same time, the ranks of our individual donors, people who pull out their checkbook and write a check for whatever they can beyond membership or apart from membership, have swollen from less than 20,000 then to more than 100,000 today. And finally, thanks to the thousands of people in this room and who are active with us throughout the country, we can say finally that membership is up, 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 up in 2009, up in 2010. And as of the first half of this year, new membership sales are up more than 24% over this time last year. Making this the first time in more than 20 years that membership is up more than, that, that membership is up three years in a row. Give yourselves a hand because we all know that it is our units across the country that sell most of those memberships each year. And we all know, as Roger Van would say, 
Membership is power. Moreover, all of our program departments have reopened. We are hiring regional directors for every region that doesn't have one as we speak. We just passed a budget that allows us to hire staff for them as well. Yeah, you can't just have a regional director, you know. <laughs> and every day, our national office becomes better able to support each of you in the work that all of us do together. Ladies and gentlemen, it is good to be in the black. Look around the room. It is good to be in the black, and I'm here to tell you that after three years of being in the black, the financial crisis at the NAACP National Headquarters is officially over. Please give our chairman, our board, and our trustees a hand. We have worked very hard together. Please give our treasurer, Jesse Turner, a hand. He has worked very hard, most assuredly. And please give a roaring round of applause to the greatest staff of any civil and human rights organization in the entire world. Will the staff please stand up? And because of our good fortune, we can finally say that the staff actually outnumbers the board and trustees. <laughs> Please, ladies and gentlemen, get ready to stand up. As I call your category, get ready to stand up and applaud yourself and all of us. Now listen to me carefully. If you have donated 1,000 hours of your time to the NAACP in the past year, that's 20 hours a week. Please stand up. Hazel Dukes, you better stand up. Look around this room. If you wonder why it costs some, stay standing, stay standing, stay standing, stay standing. If you wonder why it costs most groups twice as much to register a voter as it does us, now you know why. Stay standing, please. If you've donated 250 hours of your time to the NAACP in the past year, that's like five hours a week. Please stand up. Please stand up. Please keep standing. And if you have given any of your time or your talent or your treasure to the NAACP, please stand up too. Now let's give each other a hand because it is the hard work, the sacrifice, and the faith of the committed souls in this room and the more than 200 rooms just like it we could fill up with our active members and supporters that empowers us all to go forth with the knowledge and the faith that is never a question of if we will win, but when we will win. I reference that faith, that faith that for 102 years, whether it takes a year or 30 years, has allowed us to turn bold dreams into big victories for three reasons. One, I mention it because it works. Two, it turns our children in one moment into leaders of the next moment. And three, it is our foundation and our rock in moments like the one we are living through right now. As I said, it works. And in, within the last year, it has empowered the NAACP, our local units, our state conferences, and all of our allies across this country to get Illinois to do this year what we got New Jersey and New Mexico to do last year and abolish the death penalty bringing us now within 10 states of meeting the constitutional standard to outlaw it across the nation. 
Connecticut is next. It has allowed us and our allies to move George Gresham. George Gresham, if you're here, will you please stand up? George Gresham is the A. Philip Randolph of our moment. He is the largest and most powerful black union leader in this country. He has the largest local in the world. And he was my partner in making One Nation happen. And together, we and 400 other organizations moved more than 200,000 people to Washington, D.C. for the most diverse march on Washington this nation or the world has ever seen. And that power has an, of that faith has allowed us to even attract unlikely allies like Newt Gingrich and the California Prison Guards Union, the CCPOA, to stand beside us along with the ACLU and the U.S. Students Association to say, enough is enough. We got to stop giving so much money to the state pens of this world and send more money to the Penn States of this world. It has also empowered us to finish a journey we started more than a decade ago and pass the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Act because a hate crime is a hate crime is a hate crime. And for those who catch themselves questioning us why we do what we do with whomever we do it with, let me remind you today that as the late, great Shirley Chisholm often reminded us, we have no permanent friends. We have no permanent enemies. We only have a permanent interest. And for the last 102 years, the interest of the NAACP has been the eradication of racial discrimination of all forms and the extension of the promise of opportunity to all people. And let us be clear that no headline, no editorial board, no columnists will ever change that. Second, I mention our great faith, the faith that unites us, the faith of martyrs like Medgar Evers, great legal activists like Joel Spingarn, and martyrs like Harriet and Harry Moore. Because it, in teaching that faith to our children, we propel them to greatness. In the past year or so, we have seen the fruit of investments made in past decades bloom across the country. Steve Benjamin, raised up in the NAACP Youth and College Division, has become the first mayor of a major black city in South Carolina since Reconstruction. <laughs> Kamala Harris, a child of California civil rights activists, and a mentee of former NAACP board member Willie Brown, has become both the first African-American Attorney General west of the Rockies and the first Asian-American Attorney General west of the Rockies right here in California. And Alvin Brown, a longtime NAACP peer, who they tried to run out of the race until he ran over them and became mayor of Jacksonville by saying he was the NAACP mayor is now the mayor of the nation's largest city, at least geographically. And Stacey Abrams, who is here with us today, my sister in every way but the one my mom can attest she is not, a product of NAACP Youth and College Division in Mississippi and Georgia, an AXO champion, a writer of seven novels or more, has, at age 36, become minority leader of the Georgia Assembly. And as Julian Bond can attest, no black has, done, has led a party 
in the Georgia legislature since Reconstruction until her, and no woman has accomplished that feat in either party in that Assembly or Senate ever. Join me in giving a round of Please stand up, Stacey. Stand up. Finally, I bring our attention to this great faith of the NAACP, the faith of great warriors like Juanita Jackson Mitchell, who founded our Youth and College Division 75 years ago this year. Because in moments like these, when it seems that history is running in both directions at once, we must protect the victories and gains we have made already, even as we advance towards the next frontier. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the best of times. And if we are honest with ourselves, in too many places, they are the worst of times. We have our first black president. We have our first black female CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Oprah owns a TV network. Tyler Perry owns movie studios. And every city has its resident black millionaires. And we are duly proud of all of them. And yet, at the same time, poverty is at depression era levels. Home ownership is down. Foreclosures are up. HIV rates among black and brown kids are way too high. And high school graduation rates are way too low. As we speak, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and Pell Grant are all on the chopping block in Congress. And on that note, let me send a very clear message to the leaders in Washington. Less than a year ago, you made $400 billion in tax cuts and want them to go on forever and ever. Now you're asking us for $4 trillion in expense cuts to pay for those tax cuts over the next 10 years. Before we let the American dream expire for millions of people in this country, let alone force people to expire themselves unnecessarily, let the tax cuts expire. Perhaps the most perplexing example of the contradictions of this moment in history is that Nikki Haley, the first governor of color of the state of South Carolina, continues to permit the Confederate flag to fly in front of her state capitol every day. Now, given the similarities between our people's struggle against segregation and slavery and her people's struggle against British colonialism and oppression in India, I ask her to ask herself the question that Dr. King often asked himself, what would Gandhi do? I remember when I first realized history seemed to be moving in two directions at once. I was 20, it was 20 years ago this year, and I was a student at Columbia University. The Rodney King crisis had just ha happened here in Los Angeles, and we happened to be celebrating a friend's 21st birthday. Friend called for a round of toasts, and first we held our glass high for our friend who was turning 21, and then caught with a flash of memory, a friend poured libations to all of our peers who had died before we even got to college. 
And then someone held their glass high and toasted the fact that one more black man had survived to 21. As if it was an accomplishment in the greatest democracy the world has ever known and the richest country on the planet for a young man of any color to merely survive to 21. And I couldn't hold my glass high on that one. It, it, cut, it cut me like a knife. Short time later, I made my way down to my grandmother's house in New Jersey, and I said, Grandma, what happened? We were supposed to be the, you told us that we would be the first generations of black people in this country, the first generation of people of color in this country to be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin or the kink of our hair. And yet, we have come of age just in time to find ourselves the most murdered generation in the country and the most incarcerated generation in the history of the planet. What happened, Grandma? And she said to me, son, grandson, it is sad, but it's simple. Our people got what they fought for, but we lost what we had. In that short summation of the last century of struggle for freedom and justice in this country, my grandmother issued a subtle admonition that at any moment in the fight for freedom and justice, we must both have a plan for getting what we deserve and need and also for protecting the blessings we have already won and received. Right now, if we are honest with ourselves, all of it is under attack. The right to organize, the right to choose, the right for an immigrant to this country to be treated with basic human respect, the right of people to have a fair shot at employment and business opportunities, and even the right to vote itself. And let us be very clear that that last right the right to vote is the right upon which all of our other rights are leveraged. And without which, without that vital access to the ballot box, none can be protected. And simultaneously, what we have is under attack too. Our homes that are disappearing by the day our jobs, which have left so many places like Dayton, Ohio, and never come back. And our families, which continue to fall apart in front of our faces at rights, rates that are absolutely frightening. If we are going to stop and turn back the assault on our rights, we must be crystal clear that there is nothing more important to be fighting for than restoring expanding and protecting our voting rights. And that is why this fall, we in the National Urban League, with support from TV One, Radio One, BET, American Urban Radio, and many, many others, will launch a national campaign to both register people to vote and to make sure that we educate everybody about the new obstacles that have been placed between them and the ballot box. Let's talk for a second about the state of voting rights today. First, let us recognize the obvious. Our voting rights are under attack because a couple of years ago, a few years ago, we had a great breakthrough in this country. We broke the color line at the White House. That great breakthrough was followed by a great backlash, represented by not all people in the Tea Party, but definitely by the worst and most racist elements in the Tea Party. And now we are reaping what those seeds of hate have sown, the greatest rollback of voting rights in this country since 1896. Right now, our vote is being attacked in many ways. The state of North Carolina alone, we have beaten back attempts to limit early voting 
prohibit pre-18 registration and eliminate same-day registration. However, there are three big strategies being whipped around this country of which all of us must be keenly aware. The first is voter ID, attempted in 47 states, passed in 30 states. It has been likened to a new poll tax because it requires you to pay money before you can vote. In Wisconsin alone, it will disqualify fully one half of black and one half of Latino voters who do not carry a current state-issued ID with them right now. Simply put, people who are too poor to own a car don't tend to have a driver's license. And thus, it will have a similar impact on working people of all colors and young people and students. Tech 2. Registration ID, the one that's coming on the heels of voter ID, passed in Arizona, passed in Georgia, passed, and those will go into effect this year. Kansas has passed and will go into effect in 2013. This requires you, and think of all of us who have done canvassing, what this means. This requires you to have attached to your voter registration form a copy of your ID or passport, or your registration form won't be processed. And guess what? There's no requirement that they tell you that they didn't process it. It has already been used in Arizona to eliminate 40,000 voters from the rule, from the rolls. And as much as we would like to keep what starts in Arizona, in Arizona we need to be prepared to fight it everywhere. Attack three, the oldest and in many ways the most resistant to change, the ex-felon disenfranchisement. In Florida this year, the Republican governor promoted and signed a new order that requires a five to seven year mandatory waiting period before a formerly incarcerated person's voting rights may be restored. This effectively undoes what two Republican governors made happen before him, Pre uh, Governor Christ and Governor Bush, who restored voting rights to ex-felons in that state about a decade ago. It will push a half, it has pushed a half million voters off the rolls, including a quarter million black voters. These laws exist to one degree or the other in most of our states. While voter, and I want you to hear me here, while voter ID and registration ID are like Jim Crow, Ex-felon disenfranchisement laws are Jim Crow. Indeed, they are among the first Jim Crow statutes ever enacted. For the same reason, they are being promoted and expanded now. To be clear, the legislative records actually show that many states banned formerly incarcerated people from voting for the express purpose of attacking and dismantling black voting strength. As one Virginia delegate to the Constitutional Convention said, this plan will eliminate the darkie as a political factor in less than five years. What motivated them to do it then is what is motivating them to do it now. When we attack ex-felon voting bans, as we have done so effectively through the courts in states like Pennsylvania and through the legislature in states like Tennessee. We are attacking one of the last existing legal pillars of Jim Crow. When we fight to block and undo voter ID and barriers to voter registration, we are fighting to stop Jim Crow Jr. Either way, we must bring to this fight all of our troops on the field and the vengeance of the ancestors who have gone before. We must fight them hard and fight to win. And we must put the world on notice at the UN that Jim Crow is still alive in America's ballot boxes. Because 150 years of Jim Crow anything is a century and a half too long. And if the NAACP stands for anything, it is ending Jim Crow everywhere in all its forms and ensuring that our democracy is strengthened 
so that Jim Crowism may never rear its ugly head again. <laughs> Yet just as we, as we must fight so hard to keep on to our vote and those things that, we, that so many of us have, we must fight equally as hard to hold on to our children. Now let's talk about our families, and let's talk especially about our men and our boys, as we've heard speaker after speaker refer to this convention. When it comes on to holding what we have, there is no greater responsibility than, than defending our children and restoring our families. And there is no way, no matter what form your family may take, that our children can live in a world in which their hopes and dreams can become their realities unless we all admit to ourselves that there is an especially profound crisis of discrimination and hatred directed against black men and boys and commit ourselves to ending it. We cannot afford to be numb to the fact that 45% of black males between 18 and 24 are on a path right now to end up chronically unemployed, incarcerated, or dead. Nor can we ignore that we have more black men in prisons than our universities, nor that a black American man in, a, in this country today is five times more likely to be locked up than in South Africa at the height of apartheid. A black man in America today is five times more likely to be locked up than in South Africa at the height of apartheid. They were the world's leading incarcerator then. We are the world's leading incarcerated now, and we have taken it to a shamefully higher level. Day by day in cities across this country, from California to Texas, from Maine to Florida, these stats continue to explode in exponential proportions. As Thomas Hoyt, Jr., senior bishop of the CME Church, has said, the oft-stated axiom that the black male is an endangered species is true now more than ever. This crisis affecting black men not only affects black men, it affects black women, it affects the black family, it affects black communities and black churches. And in the spirit, in the spirit of men like Jack Kemp, who I once stood with in South LA and watched him give a speech about our children, our children, outrage about South LA, our children. And somebody whispered to me, what does he mean, our children? He ain't from South LA. And I said, he means they are American children, and they are all our children. I would add to Bishop Hoyt's quote, and so too does it undermine our cities, our states, and our nation's dream of turning its current fate around. In this new fast and flat global economy, no nation that sacrifices large numbers of its children of any color can be first in anything but incarceration and maybe debt. And as my grandmother reminded me on that day at her table, it is not enough to win what we are fighting for, our vote. We must also hold on to what we have already, our children, our homes, our families. The movement to save black men and boys has already begun. And as Bishop Hoy observes, there are a plethora of church and government programs aimed at this crisis. And yet somehow, it continues to grow worse and worse every day. Why? Because there are a plethora of government policies and practices that fuel this crisis. We at the NAACP will bring to this movement what it desperately needs. We will shine a bright light on the undereducation, discrimination, incarceration, and neglect that are creating this crisis. We will pursue a focused advocacy strategy to attack the policies and practices that have made this juggernaut what it is today. And we will provide the troops, that means all of us in this room, 
and all who we lead throughout this country. We will provide the troops across this country who will build the coalitions required to get the job done. When we take on both the challenge of getting what we are fighting for and holding on to what we have, we need not see ourselves as grasshoppers facing giants, but as giants capable of securing America's promise for all people. In order to do this, we must continue to do what we have done through the NAACP Youth and College Division for 75 years. Raise up our daughters to be lionesses for equality and raise up our sons to be lions for justice. Let us seek wisdom from the bush. Let us seek wisdom from the book of Joshua which calls upon us to raise a generation who challenges injustice, a generation of change who improves its community, a generation of compassion who fights for the weak and the vulnerable, a generation of conviction who is able to repent and do better, and a generation of commitment who will grow up and provide for their children and their families. In these times, let us draw from the wisdom of leaders like Moses that are still with us, like the great Queen Mother Marley Evers Williams and Julian Bond. Let us continue to support our Joshua's as they attempt to lead this country out of tough times. Joshua's like Steve Benjamin, Joshua's like Kamala Harris, Joshua's like Alvin Brown, and Joshua's like Stacey Abrams. And most importantly, most importantly, let us all be like Gideon, an unlikely hero who led his people out of a mighty crisis, a man who at times even doubted himself but nevertheless kept his faith. You see, Reverend Hope, Gideon faced what many would say was an insurmountable task, yet kept on despite the odds. He kept on even when his army went from 37,000 to 300. He kept on even when the enemy already claimed the victory. He kept on as God commands all of us to do. Gideon kept the course and did not waver in his strategy. Grossly outnumbered, Gideon followed God's command to place his 300 soldiers around the enemy's camp. And upon Gideon's order, they sounded a mighty sound, a trumpet so loud that it woke up the enemy from their slumber, so confused them that they defeated themselves. And like Gideon, we must now sound a mighty alarm, and we must move forward in the face of crises. And so, Reverend Deer, I beg to ask the question, is there a Gideon amongst us this morning? Is there one who, despite the odds, will stand up and lead? Is there one who will not give up when the enemy claims victory is theirs? Is there one who is willing to go into battle with just a few committed warriors? Is there one who will stay the course when the going gets tough? Again, Reverend Barber and Bishop Alexander, I beg to ask the question, are there any Gideons amongst us today? Are there any committed to leading our people out of America's crisis and into America's promise? And so as I take my seat, Reverend Rivers, I call upon each of you today, the fabric and the heart of this great association, to join me in rising up in this turbulent time. Let us rise up like Gideon in the face of unemployment and foreclosures. Let us rise up like Gideon to defeat and turn back the attack on our rights. Let us rise up like Gideon to defeat educational disparities and the resegregation of our schools. Let us rise up like Gideon, Chairman Brock, to defeat increasing health disparities and rampant pollution in our communities. Let us rise up like Gideon 
Judge Mathis, to defeat our nation's broken criminal justice system. Let us rise up like Gideon to defeat the crises that are stealing our black men and boys. And when we rise up like Gideon, I say when we rise up like Gideon, our 102 year legacy of turning bold dreams into big victories has taught us that it will never be a question of if we win the battle, but when we win the war. So join me today. Rise up, NAACP. Rise up from California to New York, from Michigan to South Carolina, from Washington State to Mississippi, from Alaska to Florida. Rise up, NAACP. Rise up, NAACP. Rise up until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Thank you and God bless.